This week on Backyard Footy. We're no longer in the days where uh, we're just going to show up and win CONCACAF games. I think that's very obvious. Um, the world's catching up. The world's catching up, and a lot of it is just because the world is more accessible. But a lot of it is, you know, the influence of the MLS, in my opinion, in, in CONCACAF specifically. Because you got guys that are playing for other national teams that we're competing with to get to a World Cup, who at the end of the day are making bunches of money in MLS and playing week in, week out, and are really uh, benefiting from you know this an American League, um, which is you know for the MLS that's great. Like that's exactly what they want. They want to be the best league, um, and so they're just gonna get the best players regardless of where they come from. But I think that. The American soccer player can't get left behind. What's up, footy fans? It's your host, Hugh Roberts. Getting ready to do something new. As I mentioned on Twitter, if you don't follow me, please follow back your footy. Um, we're going to do a new series called The Pull Up. Pull up to different people's apartment complexes, different places. You guys get to interact with me and follow me throughout the city. See, you know, what people also do outside of soccer in their daily lives as well. So, follow along. We're about to go meet Aaron and see what he's up to and record this next episode. What's up, footy fans? Welcome to the 24th episode of Backyard Footy with your host, Hugh Roberts, where each episode I dive into the backgrounds, journeys, and experiences of professional athletes, former athletes, and anyone that's been involved with the game. So, I'm doing something different now with uh, Aaron Mound. He was on episode 23. If you haven't listened to it, please go check it out, listen to the story. We're not really going to dive into the story here. We're just going to straight up debate, talk. I feel like I really haven't had a chance to just talk myself. I'm usually doing the interviewing with other guests, so. This is just a chance for you guys to get to know me as well, just for us to just talk about current soccer topics. So, without further ado, yeah, it's good, my dude. What's going on? How you doing? How you doing around the year? Yeah, man, things have been good. Charlotte's been a new, a new wave. Uh, completely different than, you know, what we used to. We've never been in the South like this before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a whole different piece. This summer was no joke, bro. <laughs> The heat's crazy down here, man. The heat is crazy. So, but it's been good. I mean, you know, besides the stuff that's going on with the team, like, you know, we're, we've been pretty up and down. But uh, I'm trying to let that affect, you know, how I view a, view a city. It's, or hard. Like, it's hard not to sometimes, though, because that's, that's what we do every day. But to have a mouthful and being in a nice city like this, able to just play in my side and put off the too. If it wasn't the case, then you'd be losing your mind so much. Yeah. That's one but, of the hardest parts. Yeah. It's just being able you know, to separate, you know, what happens at the job with the rest of the life. It's tough. But anyways, yeah, Charlotte's been love. I'm, I'll be down here living in the South End. Yeah, me too. Oh, all the way down the street from each other and shit. Yeah. So all the way down the street. Just, it's been dumb, man. How you been liking it? Yeah, I've been loving it though. I mean, we don't live too far from uptown. Uptown's cool. It's a slower pace than up north, but that's cool too. I wanted a different pace. Um, but I mean, just the culture in general, the culture down here, you feel the love. And I feel like because of the slower pace, because of like the history of the city and the area and stuff, like it's just it's definitely more welcoming. I feel like the southern hospitality a little bit, which is nice. I mean, me coming from being in Pittsburgh, being in Philly, and Philly's a little more you know aggressive some, and and. DC is kind of similar as well. I mean, but not down here. It's the first I've lived down, first I've lived from home, but it's been good. It's been love. I've been walking on the streets at night and you know, feel safe kind of vibe. So everyone here has been friendly. The food's been yeah, there's some food down here. I feel like I haven't even touched everywhere either. You've been there. You guys are going to a lot more places than I've been. Well, it's the thing about it. It's not like the places that are dope aren't really the places that are like 
you know, mainstream, right, right, not really uptown. Like, you gotta go to like the west side to get some like soul food type of, type of stuff. Now you gotta go deep in the cut to get some Jamaican stuff. Like, the food that I like is not gonna be, you know, right here in the South End, to be honest. Then you meet somebody randomly and they're like right on the spot, and then all of a sudden, like, they open your eyes to like something you've never seen before. How, how would you rank uh, Charlotte? And with all the cities that you you live in, that's all I'm always asking myself. So I lived in Richmond, Philly, Pittsburgh, and now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> this man thinking about his job. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! You can be honest, but it's the place to be honest. Um. <laughs> Different times in my life, though, that's the I thing. I feel that. That's real. Like, because Richmond was much of my early youth days. This, this, in Philly, I was living in the streets of Philly, but the soccer on the field wasn't the best either, so I, like, tainted it a little bit. Um, I say this is, like, top two, bro. It's top, top two. two. Top two. And what's the other one? Philly's up there, too. Yeah. It's, it's a top of Richmond up there, to be honest. But okay. the river might separate Richmond because the river is very unique in Richmond. And it's like, the night, like everyone on a Sunday would just go out to the river, bring drinks, cool down the boulders. You can even go on the river if you want to. People like float down the river. Like, it's an actual thing to do and an actual vibe. Talk to me about Richmond because because Richmond, I've, I've been hearing stuff more and more every day about this place, Richmond. I know you, you know, I, I do the, I do like real estate stuff on the side, mm. whatever. But Richmond, everyone's like, you know, tired of the DC market. Everyone's like, yo, Richmond is the spot. It's right there, and they're gonna build up a metro system from Richmond to DC. Cause this is a straight shot down there. I used to commute from school back and forth three, four times a week. It's just a straight shot. But yeah, it's a growing city. I mean, it's young because VCU is there, the University of Richmond is there. But it's smaller than Charlotte, but it's still big enough where there's plenty of do. You have uh, the fan area, which is like, I'd say it's, it's good like your south end. But it's like up north, so I can all uh, the fan. It's because, like, if you look on a map, you can see here in the highways that go around and open up like a fan. So that's where, like, the young housing is, like, VCU, and it's like, like it'll be like your brunch kind of vibe. And you have VCU in the middle of the whole city. And then you have downtown, a bunch of the clubs and stuff too. And then there's like, there's some culture too. You keep going called the bottom, shop the bottom. That's where you like more of your culture and some things like uh, the murals and stuff. And, uh, it's like a hippie vibe kind of, but it's still cool though. The sports, everyone knows a sports team and there's a minor league baseball team, but everyone knows the kickers because of the youth team. But literally almost everyone pretty much played for the kickers and everyone stays in like the same area so they go out playing the same system. But it was love from the jump, man. Good three years. Okay. Good three years. What about what about you though? Um, Where you rank yours? Well, I've been in started off got drafted in Toronto and then I got traded to Salt Lake and there for five years. So and then went from Salt Lake to Vancouver and now I'm here, so those four cities. Mm. Man, that's tough because like you said, I'm twenty one years old in Toronto and that's a whole different thing. You know what I mean? Like that's all, I appreciate that city for a whole, you know, different, because I, 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 it was my first city where I'm on my own, yeah, I'm in a big city, I'm just learning about myself, learning how I want to move, what crowds I'm trying to be in, and, and all that, and Toronto was dope because it gave me all them options, like, you, if you want to do this, if you want this kind of vibe in Toronto, you have it, if you want this kind of vibe in Toronto, you have that, like, it's multi, multicultural in the sense that there's all these different pockets that are, like, vibrant and cool, and, like, where do you want to be, but you know, there's 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 all you know, there's, there's options. You know, and, and compared to like Salt Lake, a place like that, there's not that many options. You know, you're kind of like, all right, what's well, Salt Lake like? I've never even been. Yeah, man, it's it's small, man. It's really small. It's growing. It's smaller than this. Yeah, it's smaller than Charlotte for sure. It's growing in the same way that Charlotte's growing. Um, a little bit more slowly, a little bit slower, but. Um, so like it was cool because I was there for such a long time and I could really like meet people and uh, meet the right people to kind of navigate the city, you know, like how long you're there and stuff. Like, you know, we've been here just trying to figure out Charlotte um, for most of the year. Um, so you know, it's years now, it's hard to like judge it because we literally been trying to figure out, you know, where to be, how to move in the city. Yes. 
Um, but I would have to say that the, the two Canadian cities, Vancouver and Toronto, it's just like what they're doing up in Canada is just different. It's different. Very international. And it's so funny because when I first got drafted, the only thing I said was, uh, I don't want to play in Salt Lake. <laughs> I don't want to play in Canada, and those are the only places, you know what I mean? And those two places opened my eyes, almost like I was meant to go there, just like kind of get that perspective. So I said Toronto at the top. <laughs> yeah, even, even though it was just one year. Yeah, that one year, you know, those people, it was just, you know, at first, and I, I miss you know. But yeah. I mean, it's facts about staying, how long you stay, because this is my third year in a row moving. And I mean, even feeling tough, I feel like I didn't even die when I feel like that. It was a good time, probably, because I lived in the streets, like, you know, with MLS guys and stuff, like, that. like, that's why. I mean, they made it a good time, but it was a big city. But I feel like I didn't even touch nothing. I mean, the year was done, moved out, Pittsburgh, flew by, and we didn't live in the city, and Pittsburgh lived outside for how long? So, like, 10 minutes outside. But no one lives downtown, it's all commercial real estate. So, we live in, like, the outskirts, but, yeah. That's why I had, had to get that site and had to just, I was like, you know what, I'll make some coaching, I'll do something that I have to live in the city. No, I'm not free housing anymore. Yeah. And that just changed my perspective on the city. I felt like I was at Matthews in the stadium with the rest of the guys. Like, where you were at first to <laughs> start, I forgot you were even out there. Uh, sometimes I forget, man, but that was different. Like, you know, it didn't even hit me that I was out there, out there until it started getting sunny out. And I was like, you know, like, we should go get lunch, talking to Lisa, like, wait, lunch. Uh, do something real like, ain't nowhere to go. <laughs> Where do we go? We gotta push all the way downtown. We're like, all right, well, we gotta get around to maybe younger, more more things happening. Uh, it's just about finding where you where you're comfortable with, really. But, yeah, man, the South has its own um, has its own little uh, you know things that you just gotta you gotta get used to and navigate, especially in today's society. It's, it's tough, so. It's tough, I mean, it is still the South, man. Like, like, we are in the little outskirts of the city, the vicinity, so, like, I mean, you might not feel it as much, because it's still a young area where we live at, but when you go to certain places, even up north near the university area, and how, like, it's just like, they're trying to gentrify the area up there, and, like, you know, push people out and things, and it's just different everywhere you go in the little corner pockets of the city, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, I feel like we, we all also look at it through do a different telescope being like professional athletes too, you know, like they might <coughs> appreciate what we do more because we're athletes, but if we weren't athletes, like how would we be with like? That's something I think about every day, man. The, the conversation changes completely, can we drop that? That's why I don't even like dropping that, I just want to see, you know, how you're moving without that. Mm -hmm. um, like mm -hmm. from Hello, my name is Aaron. Mm -hmm. where, where does that conversation go? That's so why most people, even from multiple cities of the they're like, ask me what I do, I just move down here more. Unless you physically ask me, like, all right, you want to dive into it? Like, sure, I'll dive into it again. But like, I'm just here for work, and then we can go off that and just have a normal conversation and see what that takes us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's important for sure. I didn't compare both of these leagues though. I'm just going to check that. Oof. Yeah, man, that's a, that's a good question. I'm going to start to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the MLS is at a point right now where it's like a, a well-tuned machine. Um, and the purpose of the MLS, from from my perspective, which is greatly obviously a player perspective rather than you know, front office or anything like that. Um, grow, one, grow the sport in America. They want to be the best league. <clears throat> they want to be the best league by, I can't remember the date, it was like 20, 20 something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they for it too. Yeah, I remember there was, they would say, like, yeah, we want to be, like, top top four leagues by 2025 in, in the world. That's their goal. And that's not the USL's goal. Like, I don't know that I've never heard that ex uh, expressed. You know what I mean? So just, like, the way that they're approaching things is completely different. And, and with, like, a lot of the farm teams 
um, so to speak, the you know your Red Bull twos and your Atlanta twos and your Bethlehems are tied with um, MLS teams, and for their USL teams, they're just looking to produce and give guys games and get experience. And in my opinion, I think that they should be looking to sell these guys to generate money because. It seems like that that's that is the blue the blueprint now is. is where you know you have all these academy academies and coming from a situation like Vancouver, you know, we had a guy like Alfonso Davies who would, you know, has been especially this week has been real relevant to what he just did to the US. Uh, and a situation like that where you have a kid, one kid out of this entire academy where there's hundreds of kids, and then one kid gets sold for whatever it was, um, for, I can't remember what the number was, but he then pays for the entire academy. And so, you know, you keep doing that, um, your return on investment is going to I feel like we're not doing that here in the MLS. Like, it's still better than getting international players bringing in here, but instead of it, I mean, they do sign homegrown without giving these homegrown kids a chance. Like, I do per se. Like, uh, like, bro, and you know, a lot of kids that I've met through my years of like, being like one or two, just like other teams, even in Richmond, we're partners with DC United. There's so many DC United kids that I'm like Colin Martin, plays for Minnesota right now, but he's still barely just getting any time. I mean, just a bunch of young kids that even like, I'm glad Durkham got out of there and like, went out um, to the situation, but there's been a bunch of kids that I've known who I feel like are not getting a fair young chance, but they should be getting a, a chance. Just even coming off the bench is still a good opportunity. Work their way in and just sell them and you get some money off of it. And that's what like, even like Porto or just like other small, like go smaller clubs do it and they get their money back. PSV, all, them, all these clubs, and they get the return on investment. Yeah. But I, I mean, I hear you saying, I think that it's a little bit in transition, so it's it's tough with some clubs compared to other clubs, but in Salt Lake, the homegrowns are getting tons of play. Like that whole Salt Lake team is just, well, at least half of that Salt Lake team is homegrowns, I feel like, and they're doing well. Um, really coming into her own, which is what we see. Right. Cool. right, and the same with Vancouver, you know, there was 15 year old on our team last year that was playing, you know, with us a lot, so. Um, I don't know, I mean, the, U the USL has is, is been very, a lot of it is people trying to figure themselves out. Um, you know, you have a lot of newer coaches, um, and you have like a lot of established coaches, like, you know, our coach is established, um, but you also have like young, Coaches that are just trying to figure out their style of play within, you know, the framework of their entire club. You have young players trying to figure themselves out, trying to get games. You even have young refs, uh, and then you even have on top of that, you got young fans like fans that haven't are in places that haven't really been exposed to football and at a high level, and are just trying to figure out the games themselves and understand, you know, what to appreciate. It's funny when you go to all these different places and you see what fans react to. It used to be like. <laughs> it used to be like, uh, as a defender, someone would kick the ball high in the air and the whole crowd's like, yeah, boot it, like, <laughs> kick it, like, they were <laughs> loving it. Where now you see, like, you know, uh, I've noticed more sophisticated fans appreciate, you know, playing out of the back. They appreciate um, the fluidity of the game and, our, and the different nuances that come with football and that, you know, that we see, obviously, but it might not be as apparent to other people, so. I didn't think about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just two two different leagues in two different stages, and um, it's been a little bit. Of, it was a tough, kind of a tough adjustment um, from from that sense for sure. But yeah, is the game slower? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, a little... yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely you know a second league in terms of the quality. It is uh, I don't think it's far. You know, I don't think it's far at all, and I don't think it's. Um, Player ability per se, as much as it is like the whole collective organized, like the whole collective system, um, and then with he and with this league, you're seeing you're seeing turnover that you wouldn't see in the MLS. Like, um, you know, like this year alone, we've had a ton of ton of guys. You know, and it's just that's just the nature of you getting low knees. You get this is the most turnover I've even done with real pro like. This has been like at least a full roster change. How about this? The amount of players that we've had here, even if it's on loan still, at least over 10 maybe. 
Yeah. And we still only have like 18 guys on the team. It's difficult. It's difficult, man. It's, it's very difficult. The, the, um, the end goal focus is special. So, but what do you think? I mean, I don't think it's far off either. I think when the quality might be there, it just really comes down to just decision making and then to your technical ability, just like the simplicity of it, you know, your touch and things like that. Really just decision making, like there's a bunch of young players in the sleep still and they're growing and stuff, but you see in like all the older veteran teams in like uh, Tampa or like Louisville or something who are actually just playing with the ball, like they're spending money on the player. Like, there's a, from my perspective, there's a lot more money in the league and there's quality here. Like, this is the strongest the East has ever been in this league. I say that every single year, but this is, this, this, yeah, this league is crazy how strong it is. I can't even tell you. Back in my first year, I one on the 25 game on B this year. <clears throat> Finished second. But like, the league was like, the only top four and everybody else was like, yeah, nobody. Mm -hmm. Now, like even we, I told y'all like on my last episode, like I thought 100% playoffs and just no. everything, yeah. championship is, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I got to see firsthand how coaches impact their style, like can really affect the team, how or they can train the team, or how you know a culture of a team that's you know already set. We're new guys coming in to this culture that's already been set, and we're all coming from standpoints and different culture that we've been from trying to combine it all just like there's a lot of coaches and a lot of other stuff too. Yeah. Um but yeah it's been just an interesting ride with both different coaches. It's the first time that's happened for me. So to see one coach who calls you all all off season last year, Jim mm -hmm. telling you like you knew everything, 15 different plays from throw-ins, from goal kicks, from if they want to sit back and they want to press, if I got it all, I got, bro, I believe that, I'm like, oh my god, what? <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. And then even then preseason with only nine people here, said, don't worry, I got guys coming in. My dude knows what he's talking about, bro. Like, it's whatever, got all these dudes, but yo, you were here, all these dudes here. It's whatever. We're gonna get this sorted even when we're losing, we're gonna get this sorted. But just nothing was changing, the same mistakes over and over, and you can't expect different results from that. And then it just showed like how young he was, and it was cool. And then like Mike, I've known for a while, but I've never, you know, been under Mike. Mike brought me here as well. And then Mike, I've heard about him before and his style of coaching, but to see that and to see even when we're losing for months, just the way the way he ran things as well was just interesting and different too. But yeah, I mean. Sometimes you can have all the pieces of a puzzle and not put it together and we can only do so much when you can only control so much. We had, I feel like they had, both of them had every single piece of the puzzle in every position almost. And so like, we, like I said, we can only do so much, you know? It's funny because like early on in my career, I was like, I could not understand why, why they would let coaches go first. I couldn't get it. I'm like, but it's the players out there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's us out there doing it. Like, why right. why is everyone blaming these coaches? Um, but I mean but then playing for a guy like Jason Christ, uh, who I played for in Salt Lake, and you was the first time I ever saw um, that like the the team has completely the coach's personality and the way that they play and the way that they think and like even the way that they uh, approach the game in terms of like you'll see like one team or you see like a team that has a coach at the beginning of the year and they're the type of team that's like very nice and like if someone goes down on the other team they'll keep them all bounds and stuff and then the next coach will come in and the whole thing will just like shift and that coach might, might not feel that way and yeah. Even if he doesn't say it explicitly, explicitly, you see, like, you feel like, all right, that's not the standard here. Um, we felt, I felt that instantly when Mike and uh, Jim kind of switched, like, the difference. And, I mean, we went on eight games on the beat, eight and nine, and, like, yeah, it was high spirits then. It was all, we were all on the high points yeah. until that break. And, uh, momentum is, is a hell of a thing, bro. <laughs> momentum is one of those things that, uh, Underappreciated. We're talking about bulls to see that I've never seen in my life. Yeah, no, that's not us. It definitely is not us. And, and you know, the, the, I felt bad for the fans that were showing up, man, because they're 
we had a loyal, a loyal fan base for sure. I no problem with too. But yeah, they still yeah. come out. Yeah, and support though. Yeah. Uh, and that too, that is, that also is a big difference in between the two leagues. So I remember I was on, I was on a, that Toronto team that I was on was. I remember our captain came out like maybe 12 games in the, of the year. Does an interview, and this dude gets on there and they're like, you know, guy named Danny Cooperman's this Dutch dude. <laughs> he was a DP. He's like, they're like, yeah, so, you know, just talk to us. What do you, what do you think? What? He's like, I don't know. I don't know what to anymore. He said, we're fighting to be the worst team in the world. Like we were, we started the season 0 and 9. Like we didn't win a game. And I'm in my first professional environment. Like, is this normal? Like. What is going on? People are fighting, you know, a couple of college people are fighting in practice, like throwing hands in practice type of stuff. And I'm like, wow. Like, this is in Toronto? This is in Toronto. <laughs> you know, like fights on a daily basis. Like, and the coaches, and the, and the coaches were sitting there like, let them go, let them figure it out. And I'm sitting there <laughs> like, wow. You know, but, this, but at the end of that season, you know, it being such a tough season, our fans, Literally would show up to these games and they have uh, paper bags over their heads. And oh, the eyes cut out. You know, like I real fan like, like fans upset, like it means everything to these to these you know, these fans. And um, whereas like here it's like there's a little bit of forgiveness there and they understand that you know the growing pains whereas there's not there's not that leeway really. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's a older club, no, it's uh Farm team and right. you know, second division, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, Cincinnati, when they were here, they averaged like 30 k a game. That's crazy. Was, uh, That's there's crazy. no question they're going that much. 30 k from the first year they came, it was like 25 from the jump. 25 from the jump. <laughs> from the first year? <laughs> first year <they> came. <laughs> That's incredible because, well, like, there's that much that they weren't even getting that. Yeah, since then it was, it was, yeah, it was great. But last year's game, we were in Pis I was in Pittsburgh, we were up 1 0 2 at their place, all the way up until like the 80th minute. Then they had, uh, what's my Ford's name from Porter? Fernando Ali. <laughs> <laughs> they signed him like, you know, last year, half of the year. I know last year for this year. Yeah. Came on, 75th minute, just like a super sub FIFA. <laughs> Came on, and it was like a clearance. We played five in the back, so three center back. Uh -huh. But at this point, I'm trying to think of the first call. This, this, this is a fast forward to the second goals, one one. And at this point, you know uh, Ben Zemanski, Portland yeah. Timbers, he was on our team too. Okay. So Ben Zemanski decides to take a free kick, he's like the eight. So if I'm the right center back, Joe Greenspan, you know Joe Greenspan? Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's playing with me too. He's in the middle of the three center backs. And my other dude took him on the far left. And he's way wide. So we're spread out because he's from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Because uh, um, Samantha's got to play this ball. He's the one on the ball. I'll play it long or pass to one of us inside. That's where spread out. Hits it. Goes right to the center mid on their team, Cincinnati. <laughs> Counter attack now. So Adi's in between Greenspan and Zemanski, right? Plays him a through ball. So it's two of them on one. So I don't, I don't feel like I need to go with triple team because there's a guy coming. Big mistake. <laughs> So he's right there, they get, he gets the ball right outside the circle, takes Greenspan on, Greenspan comes on, like gives him a little body, chops it, Zemanski comes, bro, he just takes it on my Chops it again, slots it and finishes it 2 1 game over. I was like, wow. Yeah. Fans going crazy, I was like 34k. True, I'm like, I think it's hilarious because I, I used to remember because when I was playing for Salt Lake, we'd always have battles with Portland and they would be like, they were our big rivals. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually played them in like a Western Conference final and like there was just a lot of, we saw them a lot over the course of the year playing, you know, however many times a year. And I remember just battling with Adi just 90 minutes, man, like he is a big dude, you know what I mean? Like, and I just remember at the end of the game, he just looks at me he's like, Good stuff. I'm like, oh, dog, you really enjoy it. Like, I you really know. enjoy it. Wow. <laughs> Bro, one time we had, they played a, a long one. He's on top of the 18, playing the ball straight to his chest, and like, he's closing the one. He's like, no, I can just battle a little bit. You know, I'm playing basketball, you battle him a little bit. Bro, I was trying to battle him, didn't even move him, came. 
blow it off the chest or whip me on his back and say, like, all right, you're not going to disrespect me. <laughs> yeah, two head shoulders. <laughs> Had to. <laughs> but yeah, bro. Where's he at now? Where's he? He's still in Cincinnati. He's still in Cincinnati. Still in Cincinnati. But he's playing? They're struggling. I think he's still playing, but hmm. I haven't really been all that like I should be. No. You watch uh, the U.S. Canada game? I didn't. You didn't watch it? Um, I watched like the first half. Yeah, I watched the first half. Too. I didn't watch the second half. I didn't watch the first half. Um, it just looked bad though in general. It was... Yeah. I mean, what I will say um, is that when I saw that Bear Holter got the job, I was... You, you know him, right? Uh, not personally or nothing like that, but I've played against him a number, uh, against his teams a number of times. And his format, his system is solid. Like, mm. his system is one of the toughest systems I've ever played against. When those Columbus teams, uh, they would spread you out wide, um, a trap would come in the middle, so they, it would, they would spread out like a three on offense, and they would put their outside backs high, high, high to the point where they're the ones, they're, one, they're playing ball over the top to the outside, the wing backs almost. Mm. You know what I mean? So. It was just it was just a formation that you could tell that all these cats that played under him knew exactly they could they could do it with a blindfold. They they could you know, they know exactly where to be, exactly where to play it to where it's just like click, 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 click. And with the national team, it can work, but you know, you got guys coming from Germany, you got guys coming from yeah. MLS, you got guys coming from next you know, all over. And you know, have what, two weeks in camp. It's tough. Especially to retrain people out of thinking the way they think for their own clubs. It's just like, so I think that his stuff is going to take time. And um, time is not always afforded to uh, on their side. Even. I don't want to, not with a loss to Canada like that. Especially Canada, Canada moved the ball well. They just, one of the goals is just sloppy. It's just all right. But you see the goals? But I didn't even see the goals. So I don't know. Um, Stephen tried to clear off the line. Davies right, Davies is right there. Oh, I can see that. Actually, I can see that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I just felt like it was lethargic. And not, not a good sign. I mean, we should be making steps forward at least. Yeah. I mean, we're no, we're no longer in the days where um, we're just going to show up and win CONCACAF games. I think that's very obvious. The world's catching up. The world's catching up, and a lot of it is just because the world is more accessible. But a lot of it is, you know, the influence of the MLS, in my opinion, in in CONCACAF specifically. Because you got guys that are playing for other national teams that we're competing with to get to a World Cup, who at the end of the day are making bunches of money in MLS and playing week in, week out, and are really uh, benefiting from, you know, this an American League, um, which is, you know, for them less, that's great. Like, that's exactly what they want. They want to be the best league. Um, and so they're just going to get the best players regardless of where they come from. But I think that the American soccer player can't get left behind. Uh, I think that doesn't, that there's no longevity there. Mm -hmm. um, so. But Canada got some players. I don't know why people have been sleeping on Canada. Yeah. I can't believe they haven't been. What was the stat? Like, they hadn't beat the U.S. in 1980 something. But there, I think this young generation for them is nice. It's coming up. They have a good amount of MLS. Davies, what's his name, from LAFC. I played in the USL a little ago. Got a good, yeah. And Kyle Aaron. Did he? I don't even think he could. He didn't go, but yeah, they still have him. Uh, yeah, they got some young cats. And they got some older cats that are just always like, yeah. Um, like your Tebas and all these guys that have been around. Um, but it's crazy because when I was in Vancouver, my son and I partnered with uh, one of the guys that played some back when he was Daniel Henry. Uh, he's still in Vancouver, but national team guy. And with all those Canadians in the locker room that were there last year, you had Davies, um, Daniel Henry, uh, you had Russell Tiber, uh, just like all these guys that were. Just excited about the future of Canadian. Like when I say like excited, they were talking about every day. Like can't wait for it because you know once they got the, once we got the bid and they knew the World Cup was coming to Canada, they're like, you know, we're in the World Cup. Oh, shit. This is us. Like we could really do something here. And, uh, and I think that you're slowly starting. And then you have a coach who was excited and 
their their national team coach was calling these guys every like on on like a weekly basis, just updating and telling him like the plans and where they're at and the process of the national team. So they really say that's different. Then. Yeah, and they've all they've all been playing with each other for years now. Like that, like every Canadian soccer player player knows every other Canadian soccer player. Like it's a small, it's even smaller than the community in the states. So, but it's even I feel like stronger still in a sense because they might not have a all the sports that we have, but soccer is still the number one sport out there. It's in a, in a very international Canada too, so yeah. you understand the game like Yeah. I mean besides hockey, yeah. It's like right there. So and and you see the same thing with like like Kima will tell you that all like the Trinidad national team, all them cats, like when I played for the seventeens with Trinidad, it's the same cat it's the same group of guys that are playing for the national team there now. So you know, these guys aren't coming in here scared. They played the U.S. a thousand times. You know, they, they've been here, they've seen it. Like, they grew up in it, and it's not, it is nothing. They're just out there playing. And they did their thing. 100%. So, um, they did their thing. 100%. So, um, I just think we have, it's kind of, it's kind of backwards here. It's pay to play system. Andrew made a good point way earlier on my other show. He was like, he doesn't think that there's that good of an eye here, a scouting eye talent in America like that, like we might look at the athletic ability and the size of a person but not necessarily the technical abilities in their brain per se with the rest of the not the rest of the world but I mean especially in Europe and other countries and stuff. And even like the Spanish countries like they have a good eye of talent because it's not necessarily we're, we're coming from other sports as well but that might have hurt us in the sense where we're now looking for athletic players or Athletic players over someone who's just very technical and might not be the biggest or you know the fastest at anything, but because of his ability, he's able to ball and I'm giving an opportunity. Or there's a sense where the kid might be talented enough and he can't even afford to do it. And so we've had oh, generations upon generations and generations of kids who still might have been interested, even like minority kids who might have been, been interested. I'm not I'm talking about like Spanish kids as well. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure they've grown up with it in their backyard, but like they cannot afford that. So it's like, all right, well, back to my nine to five. Yeah. But they were given the opportunity of how it is like in other countries where if you're just good enough and you can ball, you can ball. And that's how it should be. You think it's getting better or worse? Uh, now that it's aware, aware of it, slowly, like in Philly, if you're good enough, they'll just give you a scholarship and you can just go to school free. But that's just, I'm not sure a rebel is similar, but it's not. Everywhere, but that's that's just a high MLS academy. Okay, but the average kid isn't, isn't going. The average kid is playing regular club side versus what I did. Well, I was fortunate enough for my parents to be able to afford it, but the average kid cannot. And so, like I said, yeah, we just are missing ways of that talent. And because of it, because I'm not making the World Cup, I feel like it's more aware now. Still struggling now, like it's becoming more aware. And it's just not probably like the Eagles who I coach. Me. They're not proper organization. Richmond was too. They get their money from the youth system, but the youth system is paying so much where right? they're able to do it like that. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think it, the whole thing changed when the academies, you got academies that can identify and then pay for everything. It used to be expensive. So yeah. Yeah. When it's I think about it now, I'm like, yeah, I don't know how my parents did that. Uh, one of my boys back home is our age, has a kid in middle school now, single father. His son wants to play soccer and all these sports. He's playing soccer, is 2K a month for him. Come on, 2K a month, how about your kid going to school? Nah, that's right, like, well, that's just what I'm saying. Where's the money supposed to come from? Where's it supposed to come from? That's crazy. I know basketball, a little basketball background too, like, when you make it to the NBA, you make it overseas and stuff, you usually fund the money back. Because there's more money in basketball, you usually get, you know, dump the money back, create your own AAU team, right. and create your own. And that's why, like, like when I play, I didn't pay for anything after, like, six, seven grade shoes, travel to, like, Vegas twice, travel to Orlando for the like, Disney tournament and stuff, like, wasn't paying for anything, like, jerseys, nothing. But, like, that's why I want money, but it was because, like, like, KD is funding money to DC. Beasley, his, my uncle was, or his uncle was my coach, so be, my, uh, Beasley, you know, is funding money into the team, but like, I think soccer, not necessarily is doing it 
per se, where you know when we make it to that. I mean, MLS isn't that. There's not a lot of money like that, but it's still not being money. It's just dumping back into creating opportunities for kids to just, if you're talented enough, to go. I know. Like, I'd love to create something like that, but, and I just, yeah, there needs to just be opportunities for kids to just be able to just play and play. I mean, maybe a sponsor like Adidas and Nike can hook that up too, and just, you know, I mean, it can, but it's just a slow and steady process, you know, like, when you see football's kind of hurting itself now with the new generation of parents, the 30% decline in football with the new generation of parents, and then, and the increase is going to other sports like soccer, lacrosse, and so forth too. Like, so, because of CTE, and we're aware of that now. Like, the ties slowly shift, and soccer trying to grow. We see the attendance and things like that. The salary cap probably go up too. So it's slowly getting there. But yeah, there needs to be opportunities. It's it's so funny because like back home, like the the park that I I started playing in was right down the street, and in the corner was like a basketball court and that used to be the court like was always popping I would always go out there after playing just to kick it like because um, it was just like a place where everyone was just hanging out and I go back and that court isn't like it's pretty run down pretty abandoned right now and no one's really messing with it like that but it's like what if, what if we could change that into like a little right. soccer court Easy. What would, what would that look like? Like what would that how would the neighborhood respond to that? Like would, it, would they show out? Because I come from a a very Caribbean neighborhood, like it's like all my friends were Caribbean American, um, Jamaican, you know, Beijing, whatever it was, Trinidadian, whatever it was, it was very multicultural. And it's like they weren't, you know, basketball wouldn't be the first sport in that neighborhood, right, right, you know. Right. Um, so what would that look like if all the, you know, all these abandoned courts and tennis courts that no one uses in these parks and Stuff like that would turn into like little hundred percent. You know, happen. cage like you're in the cage commercial. <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of for me too. It's just tennis courts are in a cage. You just switch it and play the long way in soccer. Like, yeah. Bro, simple. It wow. has to happen. Yeah. It has to happen. Get your touch. Has to be just as easy. Bro, there's places in the Midwest. A lot of places still like in the brass. I forget who I was talking to down here. There's places out there in the Midwest and the South. Like they don't even have high school soccer still. And like Nebraska, like just imagine that they don't even have high school soccer <laughs> because they don't care about it. Football is just that big, where it's like what they play the same season. Or one of the parents were telling me the soccer season in like Alabama. Oh, that's, oh, that's a soccer season like Mississippi, Mississippi, Alabama is like in the winter time, so playing in the snow because football is just overriding it, and they don't want to go into baseball, which is in the spring. The only window they have is winter time, so these kids are playing in feet of snow just to play soccer. Jesus. This was in like Alabama, Mississippi. The far south where SEC is dominating. And you go to like Montana, Nebraska, like all the Midwest states. But like they're not even playing the game. And these sports just now come around the funding is able for like the junior and seniors to play soccer. Like this is 2019 now. Yeah. That's where soccer is just is not in people's eyes and people don't really care about not I mean, it's growing but not the general population cares about that yet. And that's where, I mean, national team plays a role, that's, we're not having success, we're not having a star like that maybe, but there's a lot of reasons that they're into that. And your TV rights that you even heard, I was doing some research like last year, so Disney owns ESPN, Walt Disney way back didn't like soccer. And so he pushed soccer to the side, made sure ESPN just never showed soccer. That's way back when it just started. And going to now, you still do not see soccer like that, bro. And it's been going on. I've been complaining. In the back of my head, I'm kind of complaining about this. It's college. We used to watch ESPN every single day. I still don't see it now. And it's not that hard to put a little 30 minute segment, maybe an hour, and still replaying the same football and baseball shows like over and over. There are different analysts talk about the same subject, but two different people talking about it. Like, that's cool. I get it. Because just, just give soccer a little segment, but they don't even know about the only league team here in this country. Let it not talk about it, they just joke about it or talk, put it on Sports Center Top 10 or some cool bicycle thing or something. <laughs> and that's that. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Only highlights here. It's Cristiano Ronaldo! Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. of course. A lot of yeah, international play. Stream, right? And I, I get that too, but like, we need to grow this here and appreciate it some more and put it on a global scale. And that's what people, you know, actually start 
you have to learn the game. Like it's just what kid is the sport of soccer not on TV? What kid is gonna want to play? And it's not cool like that. I was just like, that's just showing like, like you see basketball and other sports all the time. And that's why, oh wow, I even want to start it. I was playing neighborhoods, neighborhoods with my boys, and I was like, yeah, let me just pick up a ball and start. But it's on TV. Like I love the Lakers growing up. Like Shaq and Kobe and I remember crying when my mom I was in trouble one night and I couldn't watch the finals and shit like I, I, I can't watch it late night. Yeah. But it's on TV all the time, so it's cool. But no kid, I mean, it's not on TV like that, or it's cool in their eyes are like you know, watch. Like that's how people just joke about it all the time. I played basketball so like I was cool with enough of certain people in high school. Cool with the basketball and football probably because of basketball. But soccer, like I was just like the soccer boy out there, you know what I mean? Which is cool, but y'all just the soccer boy, the soccer boy, sometimes you make fun of them because they didn't just kick ball. But it's always, the joke is always going to be there. Yeah. But yeah, it needs, it needs, it needs a change. No, that's, I mean, that whole, that whole mindset is played out. Like, it's always, like, I feel like it's changing because the thing about basketball is that these cats are immersed in pop culture. Like, they are part of the culture. You know what I mean? Like, like we almost need like someone just to take to take over the team, like start playing just like Dana Kardashian or something, so we can get some. <laughs> so like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah, these yeah, guys are household names. And, uh, Very true. Like the Tristan Thompson, he was just like, I don't know, he was ranked in high school, went to Texas, and then all of a sudden that Kardashian. Right. Right. Now he's a household name, like forever. Yeah. Like, like my girl ain't watching basketball, but she knows Tristan Thompson. Like, she like, you know, like, <laughs> mm. it's just, uh, mm. yeah, man. Mm. It, it'll take some time. But I think that you know they're starting to get it. Like, was that gonna that uh, that colors video with gonna mm -hmm. with the event? Like, these guys are starting to wear the jerseys and appreciate the culture. Need an American personality, people to be repping twenty four seven. Yeah, I mean, like, who's like, getting that growing? I just like for a pop culture per se to be like MTV videos or like that's something. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, people tune in to see, like, like what well, Russ is wearing into the game. Like, like, so who is that? Yeah, I don't know, man. They don't come, though. I mean, that stuff kind of just happens naturally, I'm sure. Especially you feel like there's a culture and soccer like, uh, like yes there's different cultures with like international players and stuff but like soccer's culture from the different locker the different locker room that you've been in you know like, you're African American in the sport being black doing this and like a lot of us don't do this and stuff. Do you think the culture is missing in in a sense that like, basketball, football and other sports that you see it vividly and people like thrive off of it and stuff. But not necessarily Especially here in the States, is it like that? And before, it used to be like a rich white sport too, so like it was a predominantly, and it still is per se a predominantly white sport like that. It's besides it's an international person that's growing, but like you still don't really see blacks playing in a sport like that. Yeah, I mean, 100%, that's, that's definitely part of it because like what was, what was football and basketball back in the day other than like a tool to get out of the, their current situation? And soccer, so that there, there's the ties there. Like if you have, you know, success or like a root to success, so tied in with one culture, um, and that's not a great thing, but you know, it is what it is. Um, if you have that so intertwined, then of course the culture is going to rub off, and vice versa, it's going to be mixed within. But in this country, uh, soccer has never really been. Um, a way to get out, right, right. Um, or like a you know the first choice to get out, right? Like, Never. You know, some people aren't really you know focused on it. like, oh yeah, it's a European thing. They don't really play here. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna come from you know Dorchester, Massachusetts, and and play soccer and, and you know have that be my way. And that's what I mean. That's why it's important for me to get back in the community and like just tell my story because I know that there's kids sitting there like, man. I gotta take, I gotta, you know, there's a, there's a little use in there, like, yeah. has a basketball on one hand, has a soccer ball on another yeah. hand, yeah. who, who might need that, that, who might need that example, you know what I mean? bro. So, I want people to be scared of it, like, by the time, you know, kids these days are of age, 10 years from now, you know, they're gonna be making stupid money, and they're gonna be in the spotlight, driving through the cars and all the stuff that young kids want to do, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, 
I think it's just going to take a little bit more time. Yeah, definitely more exposure. That's why I do this show too, and just continue to shine a light on what we do, us per se. I mean, who would have thought that we'd be here right now doing this kind of thing? You know? um, Not me, dog. Exactly, bro. That's why like, we got cameras now this year too, with the YouTube channel and stuff, just trying to shine a light and constantly show that like we're different people just doing what we love and our passion and stuff. But I mean, facts too about the two different sports, like I was literally one decision, like my parents can tell you they still thought I'd play basketball right now, college or soccer. Like my mom was basketball being from New York, my dad's Jamaican, so he has soccer. But really have both of them pulling on me my whole life, bro. <laughs> my whole life. And I really thought it was ball, but my high school coach, he ruined it for me, my heart was because like he just it wasn't fun at all. And that took the love. And my AU coach was all love, and that's where I was getting recruited at. So I still play my senior I didn't play senior year high school ball in high school, but I played my senior year still at AU, my very last year, like one of the six days. Some tournaments on the loves because I loved it. But yeah, bro, I was supposed to do that. But yeah, it wasn't necessary. If I feel like my dad maybe wasn't Jamaican or maybe was from here in the States, I probably wouldn't even have touched soccer at all. Having a career and all that. Yeah, but I didn't know you were such a high level of basketball, bro. We have a bet on a one on one game. I'm going to take that bet. <laughs> I didn't even know. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but my G, I appreciate you coming. Of course, bro. Yo. All love, G. We got to do this. I think we got to do this mom. Yeah, that was dope. Yeah, was cool. That was real dope vibes, music, all that. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate y'all for following. Um, Back here, Footy Talks are brought to you by the Buckman Scars and the Golden Globe Press. It's brought to you by the Beautiful Game Network. This podcast is bgn.fm on the, in, on the internet. You can also follow them on Twitter at bgn.fm. Thanks to our sponsor, Golden Globe Press. The best choice for your set of custom shirts, hats, mugs, and other items for just your, yourself or your organization. Check out their amazing products at, for a fraction of the price at goldenglobepress.com. And also, thank you to Buckman Scars. Get custom scars for your group at buckmanscars.com. Appreciate y'all.